take another couple of questions if there are. There's one down the back, and then I'll take one from Tim, and uh, then I think we might have to wrap it up. Yep. Oh, we need a microphone right there. Oh, I was. Okay, there you go. <laughs> Stuart, do you want me to answer, answer that? Oh, yeah. Grant's going to answer. Yeah, no, we're, we're very fortunate that we set up some uh, rooftop trials, and I've sort of been responsible for some of them, including the bounty trials. And at this stage, we have not seen anything on the, the bounty rootstocks or any of the other genotypes that we have uh, used in the trials. I've been grafted over with uh, Hort 16A and Haywood. We've found cankers on a lot of the uh, Hort 16A and the uh, male vines that are that are planted alongside those, the Bruce and the CK2, and, uh, but we still haven't found anything on the uh, Deliciosa on those trials. And those plants, uh, the oldest of them are coming up to about five years old. We've got other, other plantings that uh, are sort of two to three years old, so it's very early stages at this stage. Okay, there's another one over the back, and then I will go to the final one. Up to me. Joel, um is there any long, likely long-term detrimental effects for ActiGuard? That, that's an important question. So we know those elicitors, the way they work, they tell the plant it's time to put the defense up. The plant is diverting some energy to produce this compound that's going to kill PSA. And, of course, that is done at the detriment, uh, at the expense of other uh, area. And we have some assays or so, some experiments that are going on in France, in Italy, and in Korea, where we look at what is the uh, trade-off we might have have to pay to get resistance to PSA when you use elicitors, how much energy is going to be diverted from the plant to make it resistant and whether that has or will have any impact on fruit quality and, uh, and yield. And With a little bit of luck, there'll be some uh, more information on that next week at the Momentum Conference, which I'm not going to steal Peter's thunder about. So uh, Now, there was one more. Tim. Question for, uh, for David. Um, the likely uh, foraging range for bees, and um, would it be realistic to um, expect that we are sharing the PSA risk of all the orchards within the radius of that range for our own orchards? Um, first of all, to address the, the foraging range or, or the distance that a bee from a particular hive could go, uh, the, the five-kilometre figure is used quite a lot, and that probably represents a relatively extreme scenario. Um, the bees will want to minimise uh, how much energy they expend looking for food. Um, so if there's good sources of food in the area, uh, they're likely to forage closer to the hive. Um, now, in a kiwi fruit orchard, you have a good lot of pollen, uh, but if you're feeding sugar water, that should be good, a lot of uh, sh sugar. But so potentially one of the things that our team is discussing is if you're m mowing the swards to get rid of flowers so that you can spray streptomycin, is that reducing the amount of food availability and going to cause the bees to travel further to find enough food? Um, so to bring it back to the practicality, I think 5K is, is um, probably a, a prudent step to say that we need to, that buffer zone at this point in time because we, we can see that the, the bacteria does survive in the hive. Now, will that be, PSA then be spread in that whole buffer zone of the, the, of the hive? I, I mean, it, it's really too hard to say. We're not talking about... Um, every bee in the hive having a level of contamination on them that is able to spread the disease. We're saying that we can still find that disease inside the hive, you know, six days later. And I think there's going to be ongoing questions about that very question of, of how much can a single hive uh, spread the disease. Okay. I'm going to call that, uh, the session to a close. I'm going to invite Peter McBride up to say a few, few concluding comments, um, but I just want you to put your hands together for the speakers uh, for their uh, information. Thanks, Dave. Um, just want to reiterate my thanks to everybody. Everybody's working really hard and under a lot of pressure in lots of areas. We all are as growers and so are scientists and staff and um, it affects us all. 
Um, I really want to thank you all for attending. It's a great turnout today, and I appreciate that and appreciate your attendance. Uh, just a plug for Momentum. Um, next Thursday and Friday at Bay Park, we have a conference that's over two days. And on the first day, we have a range of international speakers, and this two in particular that may be of interest to you, um, people that dealt with the Florida citrus industry issue and also Ecuadorial bananas, so the bacterial outbreaks that they suffered in those industries, how they responded to them, and some of the science around that. On the second day, um, the Prime Minister is going to open the morning. He's going to speak to us, and John Palmer has also been invited to speak to us. Later on in the day, we're going to have um, work groups or break out into um, six different um, work groups where you can choose or nominate where you want to go and which area you want to deal in. So, you know, like the guys from the US are coming down on the phage work and there's different opportunities to meet those people and hear directly from them. So I would encourage you, if you can, to please attend that conference. Thanks very much.